Bring a Bible. If you didn't, there's one in the pew in front of you. Or pull out your phone. Your phone. That's the beauty of it. We live in a world now where we can take a Bible everywhere. Amen. Everywhere. Turn microphone on. We need to get like a neon strobe light to put over in the back there. Michael can hit it and it'll hit me in the eye saying, turn your microphone on. Laser light. There we go. By the way, I got my, I got my gun fixed. Brian, yeah. He gave me this. It's an, I got an AR-15. He gave me this little laser. It looks like a bullet. And you put it in there and it shoots a laser down the barrel. And then you take whatever sight you're using. If you got a scope. And I got, Todd, I got one of them red, red dot sights. So I'm, I got, I'm actually doing it in the house. I'm shooting it across the house. Lisa wasn't there. So she doesn't, she doesn't know about it. Hey, Lisa, go out to the side for a second. No. So I was aiming it down the length of the house because it shoots that laser right down the barrel. Then you look through your red eye sight and you adjust the sight to where the, the red eye on the sight and the laser dot up against the wall match. And boy, I was so proud of myself. I got it all sighted in. And I went to eject that thing out, and I could not get that out. I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried. I watched videos. That was useless. And uh, so I brought it. Brian said, I can fix that. So I said, well, you got it to do. So he came in this morning, pulled it right out. He did it too. That's how he knew how to do it. That's how he knew. I bought a AR-15. And uh, I've got about 700 rounds. That I hope and pray every day I never have to use one of them on anybody. I'm not a violent person. I'm not, I'm not a fighter physically I'm not I ran out of every fight that my mouth got started when I was a kid and it's just not in my nature but my wife and my family is very important to me my church is very important to me and I want you to know that if you're sitting here today you are surrounded by guns and they are for the benefit of of anybody because we have people online that hate our guts and we have we started getting death threats several years ago we took them seriously so several of us went and got concealed carry license and all that and it's a dangerous world that we live in and I'm one of these I'd rather let God fight my battles anyway amen uh, but if I had to, I would. I would defend my church. I would defend my family. I would defend every, each and every one of you. Uh, or I would let you stand in front of me and defend me. I would let you do that if you wanted to. But anyway, um, I've said it before and I'll say it again. The Second Amendment to our Constitution is what is protecting the rest of our rights. And... Um, why do you have an amendment? Why do you have a part of the Constitution like that? Is it so that it gives the people the right to shoot up the government? No, it's so that the people will never have to. Amen? It's so that they'll never have to. And so we got a lot of praying to do about our country and about what's going on right now. I started this last Sunday. And I'm going to continue on with it this morning. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. If you have your Bible open there, say amen. And let's read in God's word this morning. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And put on the whole armor of God 
that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Maybe as part of this that I'm in it, like in a series that I'm preaching on, I will preach to you what we're really supposed to be doing. And I'm not positive that it's that God has called us to fight, even though we are wrestling against principalities and powers. My thing is, standing against them is winning. Taking the stand and not backing down. We were shown this week that we've got some congressmen that have a wet noodle for a backbone who could have stood for what was right even if we, they were going to lose. It's not, I don't, I, I, this is how God sees this thing. We know in the Bible that eventually the devil is going to take control of the whole world. We know that. Who lets him do it? God does. God's doing it, going to go do it for a reason. But we know that's going to happen. And when it does, it won't be because... Well, we just, we just couldn't stand, we didn't fight hard enough, or we didn't pray hard enough, or there wasn't enough of us. Fooey on that. God whittled Gideon's army down to 300. And did they have to even lift a finger in battle? No! They stood! And God got the victory out of that deal. Same thing with Jehoshaphat over in, uh, second, I think Second Chronicles chapter 20. Where God told him, you guys just go up there and sing on the mountainside and I will take care of these three armies that are against you. And again, that was another war that Israel didn't have to fight. God fought it for them and they just stood on God's side and God gave them the victory. That's what he's saying here. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to not, not be able to fight against the wiles of the devil, to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. I've, this is the characterization, this is the number that I have of these different types of evil spirits that you and I deal with on a daily basis. I know I deal with them. I was dealing with them when I woke up at... Probably 5 o'clock this morning. It was about 5.30 before I looked at my, my clock. But I woke up 5 o'clock. And when I usually, when I wake up that early, there's devils just growling at me. Making me think all kinds of things. And I don't like it. And I'm already battling what they're saying to me. The best way that I know of to deal with that is to get my Bible out. And read it and believe that what God said in that book is true and that what God said he'll do, he'll do it. Amen. He'll do it. And that's, that's, that's my defense mechanism. That's my shield of faith. That's my helmet of salvation. That's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is the only way to be able to continue standing against this. Now, I want you to think about now what's happened this week and what it's going to happen in the next 10 days. To me, it's suspicious. Why, if Trump only has 10 more days to be president, why are they talking about impeaching him again? Jim, you obviously thought the same thing I did. Now, there's rumors floating around on the internet. So I don't know what to believe. But apparently... He is a danger and a threat to these people, even with 10 days left. He has it in his power to publish every email Hillary, Hillary Clinton ever got. And I guarantee you there's a reason why she deleted 33,000 of them. But you never actually delete anything off the internet, do you? Nobody does. It would be like if a picture of you... From you when you were like 19, 20 years old, showed up on the internet, and it was like a compromising picture, and you wanted that scrubbed off the internet. Forget it. It's not going anywhere. It's going to stay there. So the best thing to do is 
Don't let them take that picture to begin with. Amen. But anyway, there's a reason why things happened last week the way they did. The reason why things could happen a certain way in the next 10 days or so. And it is because of these spirits. We introduced principalities last week as governing spirits. Jesus is the prince of peace. When he comes and he governs, the government is upon his shoulder, meaning he's carrying the full brunt of the government. He's going to rule it all. He's going to rule the entire world. Jesus Christ is going to be able to do what Adolf Hitler wanted to do and couldn't do it. It drove Hitler mad. It drove him nuts to try to keep up with what he was doing. That's why, he went, I, think, that's why I think he went crazy. Because he had spirits all over him. Plus, he was, had the responsibility of trying to rule the world by himself because he didn't trust anybody. And, and I think that's what led to his downfall. But anyway, Christ is going to be able to rule over everybody. So they are governing spirits. We learned last week also, this is a spirit called the Prince of Tyrus. It is a principality spirit. And notice he says, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God. And so on. And he is involved in getting wealth and riches and gold and silver and treasures. He wants the power. He wants money. He wants all of that stuff. And this could be typical of most of our politicians, most of our leaders, most kings, most queens in the world, anybody that rules. And let me tell you about communism. You know what communism really is about? Stealing money legally. It is about taking your wealth away from you. You've earned it. They're going to take it from you. Now, they make it may sound like now we're just going to give it equal out to everybody so that everybody has a high wage. They're lying through their teeth. Everybody knows in a communist government, it's the people at the top who are spending all the money that you work to earn, that all the factories earn. Everybody knows that. Now, turn to Daniel chapter 10. Did we pray yet? Did we pray yet? Turn to Daniel 10 and then we'll pray. A principality is and can be a hindrance to prayer. I'm just giving you some very simple principles from the Word of God. So Daniel chapter 10, when you get there, then we'll go to, we'll go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to help, us, help me preach this morning, all right? A lot of things on my heart, a lot of burdens on my heart, a lot of worries that I have. And I always need a lot of people praying for me. A lot of responsibility. So you pray for me this morning, all right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for this book. This book will do the preaching. It'll do what I cannot do. Lord, why did it take me so long to figure out that the best way to preach a message is just to read the scriptures? The scriptures will say it better than I'll say it with better illustrations, with better wisdom, far better language than anything that I could ever come up with. But Lord, it took you years to teach me that. And Father, I'm glad of it. It's, it's not a hard chore, Lord, to just stand before these people and to just read to them what your word says. And Lord, my heart goes out with these words, Father, because I want people to believe them. I want people to know them. I want them to know and, and believe them and know that they're true and know that you never lie. You never, you never make a mistake. There is, there is no mistakes in this book. And Lord, I'm grieved. I'm grieved nearly on a daily basis at seeing what I'm seeing on the internet from people who are supposed to be Christians. Who spend time talking about everything under the sun except the Bible. And Father, help us, dear God. That if we're going to be who you called us to be, you called us to be disciples. And you sent us out and said, go forth and teach all nations. 
Now, how can we teach them if we can't teach them what your word says? No wonder, Father, the world thinks we're all nuts, thinks we're all idiots, thinks we're crazy. We throw out conspiracy theories like every one of them's true, but we won't give scripture out to people. So, Father, help us to be people of the Bible, like we claim to be. We thank you, dear God, for the words that you have in this book. Father, I know, God, that there are treasures in here. And God, I'm just, sometimes I can't get enough of them. I want more. I'm never satisfied, God, with what you've taught me. I want, no, I want to know more. And I know, God, there's more in this book than I'll ever find out in a lifetime. But Father, while I'm here, I want to know as much as I can. And I want to share as much as I can. So, Father, bless these people. We, God, we have no idea. We have absolutely no idea what's going to happen this week. We don't, we don't have any idea what's going to happen next 10 days. But they're going to be some of the most crucial days in our nation. But, Father, we understand, God, that you either send a ministering spirit to a nation or you send an evil spirit to a nation. To rule over it. That nation will either be ruled over you by a loving God. Or you will put them under cruel authority. And Father I fear because of the sin of America. And the greatness of America's sins. That you are about soon to put us under cruel authority. So Father help us dear God to learn this. Help us dear God to call upon you. To be hidden in you and shielded Father. The evil day is coming to America. Give us the power to stand in the evil day when that day comes. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Look at Daniel chapter 10. If you look in the story of it, uh, he starts out uh, in verse 2. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, and neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. He didn't take a bath for three weeks. And then the four and twentieth day of the first month, I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittichel. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. And his body was also like the, the barrel. He, this was an angel. And his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like... In color to polish brass and the voice of his words was like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, saw the vision for the men with, that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. He said, therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision and there rem remained no strength in me for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption and I retained no strength. I guarantee you, if I was standing in front of an angel like that, I would pass out. Guarantee you. Yet I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me up upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Listen to this now. Daniel is a man greatly beloved. Understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. For, uh, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Look at how this angel is referring to Daniel. Daniel, you're a man greatly loved. We talk about you and all the, all the angels talk about how great Daniel is. We hear God, our Father, talk about how great Daniel is and how great a man he is. Daniel, God loved you. Now watch this. And he said, verse 12, For he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, from, from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. The very day that Daniel got down on his face before God and began to pray to God, the words went immediately from Daniel's heart right up to the throne of God, Jesus being the mediator, telling God, hey God, Daniel's talking. Let me tell you what he said. And God hears the prayer of Daniel. God says, hey, uh, Michael, I need an angel. Come over here. I want you to go and I want you to tell Daniel what I'm going to say to him. But he said, look at this, verse 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. 
Was that an earthly king? No. That was an evil spirit. That was a principality devil that was over the people and the, the kingdom of Persia, which is now Iran. Do you think there is an evil spirit over the people of Iran right now? I, over the government, I guarantee you. We got, a, we got a guy that follows our ministry. He lives in, um, I think, the Netherlands. He married a wife. And he is from Iran. And he said, Mike, he said, there's witchcraft in our country. He said, it goes back for the thousands of years, the witchcraft in our country. There's an evil spirit over our country. And he left. He's a born-again, Bible-believing Christian now. And he watches us. This is his church. And he said, it's evil over there. I guarantee you, they have a principality that is over those people. And it is why they are wicked and evil the way they are. And he said, he was sent 21 days ago to bring the answer from God. And it took 21 days for an angel to get to Daniel. And he said it... Um, Verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia stood with me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Michael is the chief prince who is over who? Do you know? The Israelites. Michael is the prince, the chief angel, the chief spirit that is over the people of Israel, and he fights for them. Michael, an archangel, a chief angel, had to step in and fight the prince of Persia and defeat him so that the angel, who obviously was of a lower power and strength than the prince of Persia, could get the, the prayers sent back to Daniel to tell him what God said. Have you ever wondered why you prayed at times and it seemed like God didn't hear your prayer? Have you ever wondered that? I have. And it may very well have been. There could be several things happening. God may be saying, hey, I, hey, I heard you. I, I've got the answer for you. But there's a time when I'm going to give it to you. Or it could very well have been God sent word back to you. But a principality held it up. And would not allow the answer of God's message to you to get to you because of a... And now listen. God allows this to go on. He allow, For whatever reason in His wisdom, He allows this to go on. But some of these principalities are hindrances to the prayers of God's people. That's how much power they have. So let me ask you this. If not even some angels can stand against, let's say, the prince of Persia, what power do you think you have over them? Zero. So if you plan on wrestling with a principality spirit, by yourself, you're going to lose every time. They're going to win every single time. Now, principalities represent a replacement of God-approved authority. We touched on that a little bit last Sunday, and I'm not going to get into that. But notice Isaiah chapter 14. Turn there in your Bible. Very quickly, Isaiah 14, 12. Again, this is just understanding spirits, college level course 101. This is the introductory course to understanding how this, the world that we don't see. Are there angels in this place today? I believe that. I believe that God sent them as ministering spirits to us. If you've ever been in a situation where you could have got killed and didn't, I guarantee you there was an angel standing there protecting you. I guarantee it. I believe that. And I've had my life shielded, my life protected. I've been almost killed. And God has spared me 
So I believe that. But this is how uh, they are all around us and, and we cannot see them with our physical eyes. So God then draws descriptions of them and um, the, their duties and what they do and how they work for us in the Bible. He says, Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? That's the devil. Son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. This is his plan. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. My throne above the stars of God. In the Sunday school lessons, we're going through the letters to the seven churches. When we get to the church at Pergamos, we find out that that's literally where Satan lived. And I was, like I say, I was up reading this early this morning and pondering this. God, Christ was telling us that Satan had a throne, a seat of authority, and he had a place that he dwelled, and it was in Pergamos. And the church at Pergamos had, as a principality spirit over them, the devil himself. Strongest devil, angel that there is. And God, Jesus, blessed them for withstanding, living there in Pergamos, where Satan's seat is. So he says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Means he wants to rule over all the angels. That's what the war in heaven is in Revelation 12. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. Who's the congregation? This church. So let me ask you a question. In fact, somebody sitting here today told me last week. that, And I may not have heard it right. But they, they had been in a situation where they knew they had been deceived at a church. Now let me tell you what that was. That was a principality. In a church, there is one authority. And only one authority. And it is this book. Just like... In our country, there is one authority, and it is the Constitution, the United States of America. Congress must submit to it, the President must submit to it, the judges must submit to it. And in my opinion, most of them rascals broke most of the Constitution in the last month. As far as I'm concerned, they should be thrown in jail for it. But in a church, there is one final authority... In a church, over a church, and it's not, it's not even me. I'm not the boss. I'm not God. I'm not in the place of God. I'm not Jesus. I'm not the Holy Spirit for you. I, even I must submit and must be qualified by the rules that are in this book. It is this book that rules over a church. And principalities says it is these devils job to remove the church out from under the authority of God's written word to be ruled over by a man or a woman or a council or some, anything else besides what's in the book. So, he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He is also known as, in Ephesians 2, 2, the Prince of the power of the air. Notice the word prince. That means he is a principality spirit. The prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. When you were lost. And you were living in sin. And you, you were telling yourself. I do what I want to do. I, li I did it my way. No, you didn't. You did everything the devil told you to do. You did it. You were being ruled over by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Your lost neighbors, your lost family members, they have a spirit ruling over them, a principality spirit ruling over them, and it's the God of this world telling them what to do and how to live their life. Which is why, in some cases, they hate your guts. So principalities seeks to replace God-approved or God-ordained authority, whether it's in a family, 
a church or a nation. Now think about it. John, these kids are yours. They come to church. When the devil is going after you and beating you up, then he's, I mean, he's working hard on you. You've learned this before. You've seen it happen. He'll care about you. His primary goal is not getting to you. Who's he after? He's after his kids. How many of y'all know that? Is that he's going after your kids? Or some, let, me, let me preach to some grandmas and grandpas. He's going after your grandkids. Because your grandkids, their mind is getting filled with garbage in this world, isn't it? You know what can put a stop to that by God's grace? A praying grandma. Say amen, grandmas. A praying grandma can halt the devil in his tracks. He sure can. Now, uh, I preached on that too. Let me tell you what I mean by replacing the authority of God's word. Number one, false Bibles. Are there Bibles that are out there that are just not true? Most of them. They're telling, they're full of lies, they're full of deceit. Half of them have got missing words. With the, if you compare the NIV to the King James, you're looking at a Bible that has 64,000 less words in it than the King James does. 64,000 words removed out of the NIV that are still in the King James Bible. That is a replacement of the authority of God's Word. You have false Bibles. You have false teachers. What I mean by that is, in some cases, you will have Sunday school teachers in a church who are teaching false doctrine. You will have preachers in churches teaching false doctrine. Christian radio. Not everybody on Christian radio is telling you the truth. Christian TV. TBN. Things like that. Sky Angel, all these different things. Three, three Angel Broadcasting Network. That's Seventh-day Adventist Church. Christian books, Christian blogs, Christian Facebook pages, Christian YouTube channels, Christian this, Christian that, etc., 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 etc. All of them posing to be Christian. All of them posing to be telling you the truth. Of that. We're going to give you the real gospel. We're going to give you the real truth. But it's not. The devil, a principality spirit, is using those things to draw you out from underneath the authority of this. And by the way, when you are under authority, you are under protection. Hunter. Hunter. Hey, Hunter. Come here for a second. Come here, buddy. Come here. Come here. See me for a minute. <clears throat> Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. All right, come up here. Let me shake. Come here. Come here. Stand up here. Stand up here with Pawpaw for a second. Okay. One more step. Take one more step up. There way. That way, everybody can see you. All right. She's standing right here. This is my buddy. Aren't I your buddy? Say yes. Stand here for a minute. Okay. Who's bigger than who here? I am. Right? Every now and then, Paige will bring them to me. Say, I need a pawpaw voiced to let them know that they need to knock it off. And I'll say, hey! You better knock it off right now. You want me to whip you? <laughs> All right. You better tell your mommy you're sorry. Sorry, Bob. See, I can do that to him. But if you come at one of my grandkids, I'm glad I got my gun fixed. 
while he's under my authority, he's under my protection. Right? Thank you, buddy. Now do what your dad said. Amen. My wife. Now, I don't treat my wife like I'm the boss. But she knows that ultimately very important things are my decision. And she knows that I will let her counsel me. I will listen to what she has to say. And eventually I'll talk to God enough to where God will make the right decision and God will show it to her. God will show it to me. And God has, after 30 some odd years, has brought us through this. We had to learn this. Because we almost didn't learn it right and we almost split up over it. God has made her body size smaller. She has a smaller frame. She will never develop the muscles that I can develop that I just refuse to. She will never be as big as me. She will never be as strong as me. She is under my protection and she is under my authority. Where there's, where there's authority, there's protection. If we want the Constitution to protect us, then we must also be under its authority. Amen? You all understand that? Do you believe God will protect you with a shield called faith? But if you don't believe this Bible and you won't read it, is it a shield to you? No, because you will not be under its authority. So their goal is to remove you out from underneath your belief and trust in God's word so that you are out from underneath its protection. Now, <clears throat> we need to start showing up here at seven on Sunday morning. Can we do that? Let me give you a quick story. Turn to 1 Kings 21. I think we had such a good time singing. Let me show you that there, there is an agent of transfer of power. And I may just give you part of this now. And part of it. Next Sunday, maybe. Y'all remember the story of Ahab and Jezebel, right? Bill and Hillary. Amen. Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab was a wicked king. But out of the two, who was way more wicked than the other? Oh, Jezebel. See, you may never call your daughter Jezebel, but I guarantee you somebody else might call your daughter a Jezebel. Jezebel was a wicked witch. And she represents, here's the devil now. The devil wants Matthew's family, he wants his children, wants his wife. To rule over them. To devour them. There is sheep. He wants to devour them. Matthew physically and spiritually both standing in the way. A principality spirit will work on Matthew. Try to get him out of the way. With whatever the devil uses in his life. He's got a weakness. He's my son. He's got a weakness. I guarantee you. And the devil will try to get him weak and out of the way. If, he, if God let him, he'd kill him. Then he would be going after his children and his wife, who are the real targets. How many times has the devil tried to get me out of this church? Many times. But not to devour me, to go after you guys. Smite the shepherd and what? The sheep will scatter. 
Now we have a man who is legally president in the United States. They are trying to smite him to scatter this nation and divide us and get us all fighting one another. Does that sound about right to you? Amen. That is a Jezebel spirit. Notice this story. 1 Kings 21.1 It came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard. I want you to think of your vineyard. Everybody look up on the screen here for a minute. Your vineyard, Matthew, is your family and your home. That's your vineyard. There, your wife is the offspring of you. Your children are the offspring of you and your wife. That is your vineyard. God has given you authority over them and, and they are using you for protection. God is blessing your children and your wife because of you. John, same with you. Rest of you guys, Brian, all you guys, same with you. Dave, same with you. Todd, same with you. All you guys, that's your, that's your vineyard. This church is our vineyard. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Our country. And in this situation, Naboth, Naboth's vineyard, where did he get it from? Did he buy it? He got it from his daddy who got it from his daddy who got it from his daddy. We have received in this country... The blessings of liberty given to us by our forefathers. Amen? Why are we wanting to sell it away to China? Or somebody else? Your life. Gary, your life. Your relationship between you and God, your personal life, is your vineyard. And the devil wants it. The vineyard is always the target. Always. So, Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in what? Money. Now, ask yourself this question. It's an easy question. If Ahab has a better vineyard, why does he want Naboth's? Something doesn't sound right about that. If a guy that makes $10 million a year and he's got a brand new 2021 BMW XLT 73AZ94... Cost him $150,000 and he pulls up and he sees your old beat up truck. And he says, oh, that's a nice truck. Can I, I'll trade you my BMW for that. I got to, I'll trade you my, even Stephen, I'll trade you my BMW for that truck. You're going, something, uh, something ain't right. Doesn't sound right, does it? Or he said, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And let me tell you something. Preachers all over this country have sold out for money. They've sold out for the congregation, for the bigger crowd, for to get more people in, to get a higher salary, to get a new car, to get a new house, a nice package to go with it because they've done such a good job. They've sold out for money. I know because I was going to do it. Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid me. Notice what he said. Who forbid it to him? The Lord forbid me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. It was written in the law of God because he had received it from his father. He was to hand it down to his son. He could not sell his vineyard. And people, I, I'm going to close here in a little bit. But I'm begging you. Don't sell your vineyard. Amen. Notice that he said, I'll give you a better one. Guys, uh, ladies, ladies, do this. Plug your ears up for a second. I want to talk to your husbands for a minute. Just kind of do this. Okay? I'm only going to talk to your husbands for a minute. 
I'm sure that all of us have looked at a woman and said, well, she might be better than my wife. Or I'll say, oh, maybe I'll say it like this. I'm sure the devil has said to you, look at that gal over there. Oh, she would be a better wife for you. Why don't you trade the one you got in? Okay. It's like the guy that got up in his 50s, had a 40-year-old wife, and all of a sudden she wasn't there. And some guy said, where happened to your wife? He said, well, I traded a 40 in for 220s. And people do that. They traded in their vineyard for what they thought would be a better one. But it wasn't. Lost their kids in the process. Lost half their stuff in the process. Don't sell your vineyard, people. I'm not ever... I'm going to sell out my wife, my children, my grandchildren. We were offered money to sell our radio station when we first opened it up. A large amount of money. And I turned it down. And God has blessed that. I'm not selling out the ministries. I'm not selling out this church. I've been offered other jobs. I won't take them. And I'm not about to sell out my country to China. They can tell you how great China is and boy, their, their market system is a whole lot better in this. It's communism. You won't thrive in communism, I guarantee you. Now, I'm going to cut this off right here. But he said, the Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. God had put that vineyard under his authority. And he said, I'm not selling it out. My, my daddy had a dream for what this vineyard could be. My granddaddy used to, I used to be with my granddaddy while he planted these vines. I helped him plant these vines. Now, I'm not about to give them up. I've sowed my whole life into this vineyard. I'm not about to give it up. Don't sell your family out. Don't sell your marriage out. Don't sell your church out. Don't sell your relationship with Jesus out the door. Just because the devil said, Oh, I can get you some better sins than the stuff I used to give you before. You know what I got in my mind they'll make, Brian? I got in my mind that they'll make a medicine that changes your DNA, that makes you feel high 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Wouldn't that be tempting? Yep, it would. Don't sell it out. Let's stand to our feet. Now, next Sunday, I'm going, to, I'm going to teach you about Jezebel. God showed me this one day. And I'm cutting it off now because it's going to take a while to, to explain it. But Jezebel is always the agent that gets the vineyard. She's always, she knows how to get vineyards. And that's what she did with Naboth. Father in heaven, I love these people. I love each and every one of them. I care about them. I care about their families. I care about their marriages, their children. Lord, there's children all over this building today. And God, the, the future that we have to offer these kids right now, God, is in jeopardy. 
I don't know if my parents or grandparents ever worried about how life would be when their kids grew up. But God, I am worried about the life that these children are growing up in. But Father, you promised these men and these ladies that if they would follow you, God, you'd, you'd build a hedge around them. You'd protect them. You would hide them and keep them, Father, from anything that would get in to harm them. And Father, I pray to your God you would teach our men. You've taken some of our good men home to be with you. And God, we love you for that. We, we miss them. But we know where they are and we're glad they're with you. But Father, the men that you have sent here now, Teach them, Lord, how to fight. Teach them, Lord, how to fight for their wife, not with their wife. Teach them how to fight for their children, not with their children. Teach them, God, how to yield themselves under your authority. And teach them, God... That their family is the most precious thing to them in this world. Their salvation. The church, God, that you've given us here. And the liberties of this country. There is no other place in the world that gets to do what we get to do in this country. God, help us to not sell out our vineyard. Help us to be like Naboth, Lord, that even if they take our lives. They're not getting our vineyard. Father, bless your word today. Bless it in these hearts. Bless them, Father, Lord. Thank you, God, for preaching to us. I need it. They need it. We all needed it. We ask your blessings now and dismiss us in your care in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.